Good evening and thank you for coming tonight. La Maison Médicale, Serge Ballon Perrin and Limbs Laboratory in Belgium are starting a series of seminars and workshops to help you to discover a truly super organ and extreme complexity, the microbiome. La Maison Médicale, with the last technology, has now the opportunity to do sequencing in, our, in your gut bacteria and offer to patient treatments and nutrition advices. I would like to introduce you to Serge Ballon Perrin, specialized in nutri nutrition, University of Lausanne, UCL, Belgium, member of the Belgium Association of Obesity, university lecturer for in, at Paris Descartes Faculty of Medicine, nutritionist in high-level sport, vice president of the scientific committee of a medical analysis laboratory specializing in nutrition biology and intestinal microbiota and three years of research at the UCL in obesity. Please welcome Dr. Serge Ballon-Perrin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm very pleased to be here among you tonight to, to talk about this famous microbiota. And uh, the idea is to, uh, for tonight is an introduction of why is it interesting for you, and especially for your patients, that you take care about the microbiota? And if you are interested by this one, there, there are going to be other sessions. The next session is going to be more technical. It's, um, the idea is to know uh, what kind of family of bacteria, of uh, gender, species, and how we can modulate it, those ones with the nutrition, micronutrition, prebiotic, probiotic, cobiotic, postbiotic, and everything. And also allopathic treatment or phytotherapeutic treatment. Then that's the more specific one, more technical one. And it's really important to have the, the, uh, you say that, the tools to, to be able to follow the, the, the third session. And the third session is going to be the one who, who's going to be the most interesting it means we will talk about case, case reports. Uh, and the idea is to see a patient in different pathologies and see what's their microbiota before the treatment, what kind of treatment you give, and the thing is, what's the microbiota after the treatment? And that's something I'm really uh, used to since uh, a few years now. Uh, we know that research about microbiota is a thing. It's incredible. It started in 2006. And every year there are thousands and thousands of publications about the microbiota. But the clinical application is still poor. And uh, yeah, that's why I will try to introduce you about that. Then today, the first <coughs> lecture is about uh, what I can call the, the, the extra human organ with multiple powers. And you will see what are those multiple powers. And like said, the famous Hippocrates, uh, a long time ago, he said that every disease begins in the intestine. And I could say maybe every disease begins in the microbiota. And maybe not, not maybe every disease, but most of them. And that's certainly sure. And we will see what's going on, why. And what is the intestinal microbiota? The definition is that it's a community of microorganisms that reside in or pass through the digestive tract. To be honest, actually, we are only studying bacteria. And to be complete, the, 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 the microorganism in our gut, it contains also fungi, virus, and everything. And that's in the future. I'm sure that we will know other bacteria. We will know the, the, the rule of this bacteria that we don't yet know, that we don't know yet. and. Uh, also the implication of other uh, virus, of fungi, and uh, things like this. But what's interesting is that what we know already 
is something that you, you can help your patient with that. And that's, for me, that's what is interesting. Even if it's not complete, if the knowledge is not complete, we can actually certainly do interesting things for your patients. And um, <coughs> the microbiota, there is the, the gut microbiota, who is the most important one, mm, who is the, the master of the others, of the others' microbiota. We know that, and there are many recent studies that showed clearly that the composition of the gut microbiota will influence the composition of all the others microbiota, included the pulmonary microbiota. I will explain you later uh, what it means. And then you have other microbiota, like certainly you know it by vagina, skin, uh, and in other places. And it's quite new, finally, because the microbiome, the skin microbiota, is only quite recent that we know there is a microbiota on the skin. And it's very, very recent. It's only 10 years ago that we know that there was a microbiota in, in, in the lungs. And uh, we, we were thinking it was sterile since 10 years ago. And, uh, it's, uh, and it, we will see what's the importance of that. And the microbiota is unique for each individual. And what does it mean, it's unique? There are two Two ways, to, two ways to see that. The, f the first thing, we know there are 95% of the microbiota that everybody has. And 95% uh, of the bacteria of the microbiota, they are common to everybody, but in different amounts. And, and that's very important. And you have 5%, they are quite specific. That, that you have one and you don't, and another one. And in those bacteria, we don't know a lot. And that, that's for sure that you, we have to be humble with the fact that there are many things to discover, certainly. But as I said before, we already know a lot of things. And that's what's important. The microbiota uh, throughout life is not the same. Um, and what's, I, I will show you on the next uh, slide, the way it, it, it's... It, uh, it's changing during, during life. Then at the first month of life, and maybe and more than that, the first life, the first, sorry, first year, um, there's a lot of bifidobacteria. For example, we know that if you do a microbiota for, for a baby who is one year old or even two years old, there are 25% of the microbiota, there are uh, bifidobacteria. On the, when you are an adult, it's only two, two person. They are bifidobacteria. Mm. And we know that when you achieve one and a half, and one and a half years old, the, the microbiota is, starts to be quite established. It's still changing a little bit, two, three, but we know that after three years old, the microbiota is, looks really like the, the adult one. And the, and the adult is quite stable, but a lot different from one people to another one. You will see that later. And what is really important is that in the elder lie, uh, there, there is two major things that are appearing. The first one is that the diversity of the microbiota is dramatically reduced. And the second one is that the, the quantity, the proportion of Bacteroidetes and especially Bacteroides of pro-inflammatory bacteria are increasing. And we know that those two changes place certainly an important role in brain degeneration, like Alzheimer, Parkinson, and plays also a role in uh, immunity. For example, we know that people over 80 years old when you make them a vaccination uh, for, for influenza, for example, the, 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 the response or the zero conversion, conversion is from 30 to 50 percent maximum. And, and that's really uh, important to know. And what we also know is that, is that if you give to these people probiotics at a high level, the zero conversion becomes higher. Then concerning immunity and a response to vaccination, it's really important to, to, to uh, take care of the microbiota, a thing we absolutely don't do recently. And other points that modulate the microbiota is for sure the nutrition 
antibiotics, probiotics, dietary habits, and geographic provenance. That's, uh, it's not a question of genetic, it's more a question of the way they eat. And now what's more interesting for you after this little introduction is to know Oh, the microbiota is established, but more than that, what is its purpose? And um, generally we think that the day before you were born, there's no bacteria at all in your gut, but it's not true. We know actually there's already a lot, of, not a lot, a little bit of bacteria, and the composition is quite... Uh, influenced by the composition of the gut of the mother. And after that, for sure, when the, the, after your birth, you have the microbiota will be mainly influenced by the microbiota of the mother. And that's why it is very important, and it's maybe a first reason to ask a microbiota, is for a pregnant woman. A pregnant woman, that's what I, I, I suggest, is when she's five months uh, pregnant, to do the microbiota test. It takes one month to receive the results, then you get the results when she's six months pregnant. And then you have still three months to give probiotic or to take care of the microbiota. It could be with probiotic, prebiotic, cobiotic, it, it depends what's the, what's the problem. And, uh, it's, I think it's very, very important, and we know there are studies that show that. Uh, for example, in uh, allergy and in atopic disease, there, there, there are many studies that show that if you give to the mother uh, the lactobacillus rhamnosus, uh, the three last months of the pregnancy and the first year of the, of the baby, uh, the, 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 the proportion of atopic uh, reaction reduced, is reduced by 50% considering what's expected genetically. And, and that's, that's very, very important. And then, as I said, the, the, the microbiota of the mother will be very important for before birth, especially for the, for the d delivery. And after that, if she, uh, for the breastfeeding, we know actually that the mother was, a, a, I would say, a, an awful, uh, microbiota, uh, the breastfeeding maybe will not be so good uh, because you will give bad bacteria. We know that 70% of the bacteria are passing through the maternal uh, milk and uh, yeah, there are other interesting products in, in uh, maternal milk certainly, but it's, it's just another point to say that it's very, very important to know if the microbiota of the mother, the pregnant mother is good or not. And then, after that, progressively, there, there is a layer of bacteria who's, fo who's formed, and it's going to be there will be more more uh, rules for 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 this microbiota. The first one is to protect the intestinal wall and ensure good intestinal permeability, and that it's very very important. And a thing that I I started and to really understand is that the microbiota is the first key for the good permeability of the intestine. And the idea that you have to give glutamine, uh, vitamin D, zinc, it's, it's true and it's interesting, but if the, the, the microbiota is not good, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be okay. You will see why after the, this slide. Okay, then, uh, yeah, the, the, the intestinal barrier is absolutely essential in, in the different uh, pathologies like immunity disease, obesity, diabetes, or, or, or concerning brain. Um, we know that there is the, the, this barrier will be really the interface the, the, the between what's going on in, in the microbiota and different stimuli and different stimuli they are most of them are, are related to uh, metabolomic products then some different uh, things that are produced by the bacteria and they are going through 
the intestine, and they will interfere with immunity, obesity, uh, insulin resistance, diabetes, our brain. I will see that later in uh, more in details. And the first, the first point to assure uh, a good um, gut permeability is the mucus. And what's the mucus? You can see here uh, what it is. It looks like that, and you have this all around your to protect all your gut. Mm -hmm. And in different levels, I will see you the different levels after that. And then you have here, it's in the, you have the, the, the layer, w the, the layer with underneath the first one, this one, in this one you have bacteria, in the other one it's not sterile but closed than that. And here you can see the intestinal barrier, you have the M cell. What are the M cell? The M cell is, is a, a door to, to um, and a possibility for, for, for gut to, to, to give the information to the immune system. Then it participates to what we call the oran, or, oral tolerance. Mm -hmm. And you have the goblet cells. The goblet cells are producing the mucus and the panet cells that's the cells they are producing uh, antimicrobial peptides to, to make uh, order in the, in, in, the, in the gut, in the microbiota, sorry. Um, <coughs> here, it's a thing, I don't know if you know that, but it's very interesting to know, is that in the small intestine, the, the mucus is quite loose, and it's normal it's loose, because you should uh, absorb nutrients, and then it's normal the nutrients could go through, and you, you will produce many enzymes to digest those nutrients, like the lactase to digest the lactose, you have the diamine oxidase to digest the histamine, you have other enzymes for digestion, and it's normal that the, 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 the exchange here is, it could, could be easily done. And the way to avoid problems is first the fact that the, the motility is quite rapid and that's the problem if you have what we know the, what we know the SIBO you know what the SIBO is and the SIBO the small intestine bacterial overgrowth and we know that the first cause of the SIBO is a, a problem with a, with a gut motility and the first cause of this gut motility is when you get an enteric infection what we call a tourista or something like this, uh, with the Campylobacter, Shigella, Salmonella, or uh, Escherichia coli. And uh, by a, a mechanism, a complex mechanism, we know that th those bacteria are producing a toxin, and we are producing antibodies against this toxin, but the problem is that those antibodies are uh, reacting against some motility complex in the in the what we call the second brain around the, the gut and then the motility is disturbed and and it means that the the, the it's uh, it's really uh, the the motility yes is is decreased and then there's a, a huge stagnation of bacteria and that's the overgrowth and that's a, uh, that's a cause of that and then normally the motility is quite rapid, important, and also you are producing antimicrobial bacteria, uh, peptides, sorry, to, to kill bad bacteria. That's what happens in the small intestine. In the colon, it's different because at this level you have a lot of bacteria, and, and, and all the bacteria, there's a stagnation of a lot of bacteria in the colon. And for that reason, you have the inner layer of mucus was quite thick and the permeability is really little and uh, that's very very important and we'll show why and what's interesting too uh, for cl a clinical approach it's when you see you have the ileum when the, 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 the mucus is thinner after that when you arrive in the colon the, the mucus becomes thicker and thicker but it's interesting to see that this place here, uh, uh, what we call in French the uh, fossiliac uh, droite, mm? it's, um, it's 
most of the time the place where people have, have pain. And uh, maybe it's not a hazard, maybe it's related to the fact that the ratio between bacteria or, and probably pro-inflammatory bacteria and protection by the mucus uh, is, is, the, the, is the, the, the ratio is higher. And, uh, and voila. And concerning this mucus, it's, um, there are many good bacteria. They, have, they play a the rule, like the bifidobacteria, lactobacillus, or fecalibacterium. They are very, very important to help to produce mucus to protect the intestine. And you have the Ackermansia mucinifila. I don't know if you know this one, if you heard about this. This is the famous bacteria of obesity. This is, uh, and it's not true, because there are other bacteria of obesity, but that's the idea. It's, the, it's um, because we, there are many studies that show that if the Ackermansia level is reduced, the risk of obesity is higher. And, uh, and we actually know that the Ackermansia uh, <coughs> will stimulate the, 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 the fact that the tight junction are, 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 are well uh, are functioning better and then the permeability is better. And for, for the little story, they, they make a study when they, they used Akermansia, but uh, pasteurized Akermansia. Like it means the, 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 the bacteria were dead. And we see that even with dead bacteria, the, the, the effect happens. And, and it's a revolution in, in the, the knowledge about bacteria because we know that there's a rule and activity of the bacteria which is related to the protein on the surface of the bacteria. And even if you kill the bacteria, they play the rule. But the, the, we have just uh, an effect when they go through, but the effect didn't remain because there's no colonization. And that's why it's important, and that's what I'm using now, like a probiotic. There exists now a probiotic with a double coating, we really protect the bacteria from the, the gastric acidity, from the bile. And there are many publications that they show that this type of uh, probiotic, you have 100 times more uh, bacteria alive in the colon. And that's important to, uh, to, to make another colonization, to move, to, to, sorry, not to move, to change the, the microbiota composition. And that's what I see in, in the test. Well, there is, to talk about this, the effect of good bacteria on the mucus and on the, 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 the gut permeability, uh, there is an interesting study. The study wh where they use what we call gnobiotic mice. What's a gnobiotic mice? A gnobiotic mice is it's a mice who was born uh, by a caesarean uh, birth delivery without microbiota, normally or close. And they will modify the microbiota. And in this case, they used two groups of mice. The first one, they didn't give them uh, fibers. And the other one, they gave them a diet with fibers. And after that, they, 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 they gave them enteric pathogen. Enteric pathogen and they, they, they make a cut section to see what's going on in the group who received a fiber-rich diet, and the other one was a fiber-free diet. And what we see is that the, the, the group that receive a fiber-rich diet, there's a lot of mucus, and the bad bacteria, the one you can see in the, the red one here, they didn't have access to the, uh, to the cells, and, didn't, and they didn't inflammate, and didn't create an inflammation in, in, the, in the intestine. For the other ones, uh, with a fiber-free diet, the same enteropathogenic bacteria had a really inflammatory effect. And that's really important to know the balance between good and bad bacteria because and that's what I see in my patients. That sometimes I have patients with a, with a microbiota containing really bad bacteria, uh, enterobacter, klebsiella, uh, other proteobacteria, or bacteroides, uh, and they didn't have any symptoms of anything. 
because on the other hand, they have a lot of good bacteria. They probably have a good layer of mucus and the, the bad bacteria are just going through and they don't influence anything. And uh, I, I'm quite sure about that. Then concerning the microbiota, concerning, sorry, the microbiota and the mucus, we actually know that the I gene count, that's what, th that's the terminology, I gene count, it means a lot of bacteria and a good diversity index and many of the, the different families, it's quite equally uh, divided and rich in good bacteria, it's very important to have a good mucus. It means it's a mucus, it's what we call the muc MUC2. The MUC2 was a MUC2, it's a type of mucus uh, with a lot of cysteine and is uh, quite, the, the permeability is quite good. And also it's good for stimulation of the, the enzyme, the FUT2. The food it's an enzyme who's producing fucose, and fucose is a sugar in the mucus that the good bacteria, they like it. And then they go in the mucus because they like it. And uh, it's, a, it's a way you have to, to give them the food they like to, uh, to attract them. And in this case, the, the, the mucus is more impenetrable and, and more hospit hospitable for good bacteria. And this is what we call the microbiota signature. Uh, for example, you have, you have microbiota signature for many diseases. Uh, I cannot talk about everything tonight, it's just uh, an introduction. But, for example, in the famous irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, this is the famous syndrome, we have many, many patients in my consultation are coming for that. Uh, and everything with not a Crohn disease or rectocolitis is uh, IBS. Uh, that's the thing. Then IBS, there are many, many different um, possibilities to explain the IBS. but. Concerning the microbiota, we know that there is a specific signature and you don't have enough of the good bacteria like the Fecalibacterium, Lactobacillus and Bifidobacterium. And you have in the IBD, then in the Crohn disease, uh, for example, you don't have enough of this one and also you don't have enough of other one. It's really, all the good bacteria are really uh, disappearing. Now, in the present in a really low proportion. And concerning also the irritable bowel disease and syndrome, uh, you have many, too many of the bacteria they are eating the mucus. And we know that, for example, the H H2S producing bacteria like the Bilophila or the Sulfovibrio, there are many. The terms are a bit strange at the beginning, you have to be used to that. And, but we know that those bacteria are producing hydrogen sulfide, and this hydrogen sulfide is cutting the, the, the mucus, because we know that the, 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 the disulfur disulf bridge are very important for the permeability of the mucus, and they are, they, are, they are destroying that. And the dorea also, they are destroying the mucus too. And that, that type of bacteria destroying the mucus, and when you are in a inflammatory bowel disease, you find also that pathogenic bacteria like coli, enterobacter, klebsiella, proteus, prevotella copri, because there are many different prevotella, and fusobacterium, fusobacterium is the worst one, they are present in a large amount and they, they can inflammate the intestine. And that's very important because even if we know that one person with a, with a perturbed microbiota like this concerning his genetic maybe will not develop a Crohn disease. That's, that's what we know. They know that there's a genetic uh, uh, susceptibility to develop it with the same microbiota than somebody else. In patients, they have this susceptibility. If you uh, uh, modify the microbiota, you can you can really improve their situation and you can, they ev eventually can quit the anti, uh, the suppressant medication that they take and that's the, the, the immunity suppressant medication, sorry, that they take. And I will show you a, a case, already a case report for a, a patient with an irritable bowel syndrome 
And this is a 62 years old patient. She came to my consultation and she has many symptoms. The first one is she gained weight since stopping smoking. It's not really a surprise. But she gained 10 kilos. And she can't lose them, even if she stopped bread, pasta, sugar, and, and different carbs. She was diagnosed as a pre-diabetes six months ago. She tried to take the, the metformin, 500 milligrams, one a day. No, it's a, it's a low dosage. It doesn't have for her any effect on her, on her weight, lose, and she didn't check anything. She has digestive problems, like she has often pain in the left flank, bloating. She cannot tolerate leeks, onions. She has episode of diarrhea, and she is also tired and other symptoms. This is the, the blood pressure, the local, uh, localization of the overweight. She, in this background information, she has different inflammatory and allergic reaction. And when we check the biology of this patient, uh, we can see that she effectively she, the level of glucose is too high, the, the glycated hemoglobin is also a little bit too high. I know that no, you know that under six is what you have to achieve for a diabetic patient and concerning the insulin resistance and the effect of hyperglycemia uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the vascular system, microvascular and, and microvascular system, the, the, idea, the ideal level is to be under 5.5. Then we are on 6.1, it's already a lot too much uh, for, for vascular future. Then certainly there is already, it's the limit of the diabetes here. She doesn't have inflammation, liver enzymes okay, cholesterol is not, uh, uh, 218 is acceptable. The thyroid seems to be okay. Iron is too low, very important to check the saturation. And vitamin D is okay, A is okay, zinc is too low. And what's interesting concerning uh, the digestive problem is I always checking what's a panel of IgG. You know, the IgG, there's um, a misunderstanding about the IgG interpretation most of the time because uh, the allergologists say the IgG is just bullshit. Huh? And uh, some others are using the IgG like the Bible. And, and uh, I think the, the truth is in between, uh, as many times. And, and uh, we know that IgG level, what it is, it, it's the fact that you are producing IgG concerning a food who is abs absorbed, not completely digested. And uh, your immune system produces the IgG, it's what we call the uh, allergy type 3, the type 3 allergy that could give sometimes uh, inflammation symptoms between 5 hours and 5 days. Right? That's what we call the uh, retarded allergy. And it's not easy because if you have, a, for example, people, they have a reaction like this to, to uh, casein, uh, to, to dairy proteins like casein, they, they eat it, they don't have any problem, they eat cheese, for example, and they, in the cheese, in the hard cheese, there's no lactose, and even if they are lactose intolerant, they don't have any problem. But maybe they will feel that mm, the, the news is blocked two days after, and they don't make the relation between, because it's, it's two days after, it's not like the IgE with the immediate uh, reaction, a few, few minutes after that. And, uh, and what I, I want to say is that when you have Sometimes IgG we are elevated. It's interesting, and it's interesting to avoid this type of food during two months to see what's going on. But it's not a Bible. Sometimes, sometimes you have different IgG level. They are, uh, the, the level are higher just because the permeability is not good. It's a marker of uh, a gut permeability disorder. And that's really important. And sometimes that's a problem with people. They're asking a lot of IgG, and they are they are um, ask they ask to their patient to to avoid many of the food because if there is a, a big uh, a big leaky gut, 
you're going to have many IgG positive or, or, or elevated. And then you're going to give a, a diet which is not acceptable, which will be too restrictive, and the patient will arrive to an allergologist uh, completely, uh, uh, he has lost, lost 10 kilos, he's completely tired, exhausted, and the allergologist will say, oh, who gives you that? And he's right, in a way. And, and um, voila, that's just to say that it's an important analysis, but you have to uh, see in a more global context if it's related to a problem of gut, of a leaky gut, or not. But here, no problem. And um, the IgA gliadin, um, you know, for the, you know, that's not the classical test for the for the celiac disease. For the celiac disease, it's just, trans, just as the IgA transglutamine, you know. But it's interesting because many patients arrive in my consultation they, they already did the, the the other test. That's why I don't ask it, because and it was negative. But at the lower level, they have a problem with, a, with a, well, IgA gliadin when it's high, it's important to consider because the IgA is uh, antibodies produced from, from, from the mucosa. And we know that, for example, you have the IgA against candida. They are really related to a candida uh, invasion and proliferation. Uh, and on the other side, the IgG against candida, it's not easy to, inter to interpret it because the IgG, many people have IgG against candida positive because they have some candida that go through the barrier one, one day in their life or, or, or more, more than that. And, but the IgA, it's rarely uh, elevated, but it's more important to consider that. Um, another test, I don't know if you know the, 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 meta the metabolites, produced by uh, candida or by the, the microbiota. And this is the, the D-rabinitol. The D-rabinitol is a sugar alcohol was produced by the candida and only by the candida. There's no other cells was producing this. And it's the thing I, I'm, I'm using since uh, 20 years now. And it's very, very interesting to know if your patient has uh, uh, candida proliferation in his gut. Because even if you do a PCR for candida in the stool, I, I had many uh, experiences of patients, there are many symptoms of the candida uh, proliferation in the, in the gut. For example, they feel bloated, gas, they have uh, transit problems, tired, memory problem, brain fogging, all, all the specific uh, symptoms of the candida proliferation. And, I did this test and it was highly positive. I give them a treatment with an, 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 uh, an anti-candida treatment with an istatin or it could be a fluconazole or, and they felt a lot better. And the test I did in the PCR in the stool, even if it was a PCR and not a culture, it was negative. And it's a bit sp special, but we know that the candida uh, can produce a specific protein, the name is the adesin. We will make an adhesion with a, with a mucosa. And that's why, like the, the gastroenterologists, they know that when they do a fibroscopy and they, they, they see some white uh, spot uh, in the esophagus, it's a candida thing. And there's the same thing in the gut. And sometimes you can have gut proliferation, but you don't find it in the stool. That's a technically an th interesting thing. And the Rabinitol, there are many studies that were made um, in children uh, with a candida proliferation, and they see that it's a good marker. And voila, that's the thing. It's easy to do. It's uh, the first you in the morning. And uh, the only thing I ask is to eat carbs or sugar the day before. Because if you don't, it's a dynamic test. Then if you don't give the candida food, uh, they will n it will not produce this thing, and then you can have a false negative. That's a, that's a trick. And finally, the microbiota of this patient. And this is the way it is that the, represent, the representation of the microbiota is done by the lab. You have on the right side, with a green, it's not a circle, but uh, you understand me. Uh, this is the ideal composition of the microbiota with a big different families 
we will see that more specifically uh, during the second session uh, in two months. Uh, for the one we're not disgusted by the first one, uh, but it's uh, it's the, the first, the biggest family is the Firmicutes family. The second one is what we call the Bacteroidetes. This is the Actinobacteria con containing the famous Bifidobacteria. The pink one is the it's pink, but it's really bad bacteria. It's the Proteobacteria. The, 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 this light blue is um, concerning the Ackermansia, it's also a good bacteria, and there is a little line in black, this is the, the Methanobrevibacter, they are producing methane, and this one are the, the one we don't know who they are. And, and this is the ideal representation, and this is the representation of the patient. And as you can see, it's not exactly the same thing, and if we go far away in, in, the, in the representation of it, here you find first point, the diversity. Diversity is quite okay. And then you have the different big families and you can already see that there's a lot of this one. And we will see later what it is. We see that we don't have, in this patient microbiota, we don't have enough of the famous Fecalibacterium. Fecalibacterium is a absolutely uh, amazing bacteria were produced with stimulated production of mucus and who's producing what we call the short chain fatty acids. The famous short chain fatty acids, they play a role in many, many, many uh, problems like uh, metabolism, brain, inflammation, Im immunity, colic cancer, uh, many, many things. And indeed, means not detected. That means that you. It, doesn't mean there is no, and it doesn't mean that if you don't have it, you cannot change it. You can, you can change it, but the level is really, really low. And um, you don't have enough of this one too. You don't have lactobacillus, not detected also. And the bacteroides is really, really high. Now in the lab, we have more um, specification about the bacteroides because there are different bacteroides. Yeah, we, can, we, can, we gave the, the, the level of the vulgatus, the, the fragilis, the, the theta iota omicron. Not a, it's a good one. It's not a, this one's a good one. And, uh, and voila. Here, the bifidobacteria level is also very low. All the, the famous pathogenic bacteria, is, that's quite okay here. And the achermansia, the obesity bacteria, is also, the level is also very low. And it's really interesting to, when you see the microbiota of, of this patient, and when you see what we know about, we know what the metabolite endotoxemia, I don't know if you heard about it already, and it's the process that makes the link between the, the way you eat, the gut microbiota, and the insulin resistance, and more of that with what we call the NASH, the non-alcoholic steatosis hepatitis, we can become a, a, liver, a liver cancer uh, after that. Hmm? That's that's really a big problem when it, after a lot of time, it becomes that. And we know that what we call the Western diet, it means with high fat diet, low fibers diet, that's the uh, finally the, the the thing you can find in the, in the States, in a way, in England too. I, I made the I made the discovery yesterday when I was asking for a courgette. I think it was served like in Italy, but it was fried, completely fried, with a little bit of courgette in the middle. But well, never mind. Then this is the the, the Western diet, and. Uh, what well, the thing with the Western diet is that it makes it modulate your microbiota, and you don't have enough of bifidobacteria, enough of Achaemantia bacteria, and it stimulates the growth of bacteroides and proteobacteria. And it's exactly what we have in this patient. We don't have enough of Achaemantia bifidobacteria, and we have a lot of bacteroides. And the thing is, those bacteroides, they are gram negative bacteria they have on their surface uh, what we call the LPS. This is the lipopolysaccharides on, on the surface. And the fact that you don't have enough of this good bacteria makes that the, the tight junction are not 
tight, the makes also that the mucus layer, layer sorry, is, is too thin and that makes that the permeability is not good. And on the other way, you have a lot of lipopolysaccharides and they're going through the intestine and after that they reach a macrophage and specifically the, the specific toll-like receptors, like the toll-like receptor 4, and those ones are producing cytokines like adipokines and things like this, and they will make an inflammation in the visceral fat. And this inflammation will um, induce insulin resistance, and finally you gain weight with the insulin resistance. That's also the problem, and it's a vicious circle. And the there's going to be also an inflammation in the liver which is going to create a steatosis, the accumulation of fat and inflammation. And that's the process. And it means that in this patient, that's to remember uh, all the symptoms she had. In this patient, what, what if we hadn't taken biology? For example, without examination, you just see the patient, she, she tells you that she has this, 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 and this problem, and you say, okay, finally, she is an, has an overweight, probably a pre-diabetes, I have to control that, and she has probably an irritable bowel syndrome. That's what you know. And you say, okay, I will give her a low-calorie or low-carb diet, and with maybe a little FODMAP, because we know that FODMAP is a, is a, is a thing that everybody knows about irritable bowel syndrome, even if it's not always the diet you have to give. And that's what you would do. If you do a blood test, now I do a biology, I test the IgG, I test the metabolites in the urine. And what can I say after that? That she has yeah, an overweight, slight diabetes, some deficiencies, she has no food allergy type 3, and she has no candidiasis. And what will I, what, what's going to be my attitude? I can I give a low carb diet, certainly, metformin, probably, and correction of deficiencies. And what can you do now if you did the microbiota test? Your conclusion are the same, plus you know that this patient has a microbiota that predisposes to diabetes uh, with insufficient acromantia, bifidobacteria, and an excess of gram-negative bacteroides. And it means that your therapeutic attitude is going to be different because in this case, we know that you will certainly not give her a, 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 a protein diet or a keto diet. It's going to be, uh, the efficiency will be okay for, for the first week, but after that, the, 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 the quality of the microbiota of this patient will be worse than before. And she will regain weight like that. And it's more interesting to give a low-carb vegetarian diet. Well, I will not explain this now, but that's the idea. It means that it's low-carb, but you pay attention to give more prebiotics. It's going to be a bit more vegetarian, not too many proteins. You're going to give metformin, for example. We also know that the metformin, metformin is an incredible medication. I don't know if you know that. It's maybe one of the three, the three top medications. You have the melatonin the aspirin at a low level, and the metformin. And the metformin, we know that metformin has an F interesting effect to lose, uh, help to lose weight, to, to correct the hyperglycemia, to modify the microbiota. We know that the, uh, metformin can increase the Ackermansia level, for example. She also has a, an interesting effect on cardiovascular disease and in cancer prevention. Then it's a very interesting medication. And correction of deficiencies and a microbiota treatment. In this case, because she has all those symptoms with diarrhea, pain, and everything, I will give her flagyl to reduce, then it's metronidazole, uh, it's a specific antibiotic, as you know, to reduce the level of bacteroides. You have I will not give antibiotic for the same patient with a microbiota uh, around this type without those symptoms. Because it means here there are probably some uh, antihopatogenic bacteroides. That's why she has those symptoms. And she felt quite better after the treatment. And I'll, I will give her that, plus a high dose of probiotics, cobiotic, proacomantia. And this is the treatment I give to her, an adapted diet with a glucophage 
than the metformin that I always increase the progressively the doses because otherwise you can have diarrhea of, uh, and, and this uh, in, in comfort that's important. I start with half of a pill twice, twice a day, half of a pill and, and progressively I go to two pills. I use the Fragile not three times a day, 500 milligrams, but two times a day for 10 days. Plus, I give an antimicrotic on the day three to avoid candida, and a probiotic and a cobiotic for the acamantia. And she felt quite a lot better. This is for the one who will be interested in the, the, the microbiota analysis. This is a list I made with a really known university gastroenterologist in, in Belgium about which type of antibiotic is the one who's really uh, <coughs> more adapted to this type of bacteria. But as I said before, you really have to, to take care about the, the clinic. You, I will not give antibiotic like this uh, so easily, uh, uh, for sure. Well, the second, the second rule of the microbiota is to modulate the immune response at the intestinal level and at the distance, then how does the microbiota make to, to, to achieve this goal? The first thing is to prevent pathogens from accessing epithelial receptors and crossing through M cells and tight junctions. And then, yeah, they are, they are just there. That, that's the first thing they do. The second thing, they are producing bacteriocin. It's what we call actually uh, postbiotic also. It's, uh, we know that actually there are some medications that are containing a mix of probiotic and bacteriocin in acute diarrhea. It's really, really interesting. And they are also stealing food from pathogens, for sure. And they are modulating immunity. And that's very, very important. They, they do it by two ways. Um, or they go through the, the M cell and then they arrive to a receptor on the dendritic cells, the, what we call in English this, uh, the present, presenting antigen cells. Or you know that this dendritic cell, they, they could uh, put an arm here in between to, to, to test what's, what's the ambience in the microbiota. And they will inform, they will present what they, what, what, what they have here to the native or the, na the naive lymphocyte. They are not so naive because they know, they know exactly who is good, who is not good. And they will uh, respond uh, uh, considering what, what, uh, what is presented to them. And um, they could be transformed in the, what we call the lymphocyte uh, re regulator, it's a, a T-reg, and, and those one are the ones who say, okay, calm down, everything's okay, the house is not in fire, and uh, it's going to be okay. And Or they could be transformed in the other type of lymphocyte, that's what we call the TH1, TH2, TH17, for example, and those ones are, are really inflammatory. Uh, lymphocyte, they are producing some inflammatory cytokines. And it's, this mix naturally occurs to everybody and it's what we can call the low level ignition. It's like, um, yeah, it's like to, 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 to be attentive to, to something. And that's important. But if the balance is not good, that's, that's the problem. If you have, for example, a, a quite balanced microbiota, and also you have the genetic susceptibility, and it's quite balanced between fire and water. It's a, a bit I can symbolize it this way. If you have an excess of pro-inflammatory bacteria like this one, like the TH17, and is going to make that create inflammation and s specifically uh, and more if you if your uh, genetic susceptibility is high and it, com it becomes a Crohn's disease for example we also know that for Crohn disease there are some Crohn disease that are caused by candida 
And th in this case, they are candida, invasion of candida, and they are genetically, the, 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 the response of, this, of TH17 to the candida is too high, too important, and that creates a really big inflammatory disease in the intestine. That could happen. And the other way is that you don't have too many of inflammatory bacteria, but you don't have enough of good bacteria, and the result is quite the same. What happened? Okay, and then you have signature, like uh, I was talking about the signature, uh, about the IBS and the IBD. Here is an example of the signature in the Crohn's disease. We know that in Crohn's disease, here, you have too many Escherichia coli, too many Fusobacterium, and not enough Fecalibacterium. And uh, in a health patient, you have a lot of Fecalibacterium and not, not a lot of those ones. That's typically a signature of that. But what's interesting is that the inflammation could occur not only on, on the intestine, uh, but uh, uh, at a distance, and for example, in the lungs. And uh, as I said before, it's only in 2010 that we discovered there was a pulmonary microbiota that be before we were taking it, thinking it was sterile. That's uh, really interesting. And we know that if you have a virus infection, you have a, your immune response in, 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 the, in the lungs uh, will thick, will be uh, modified, influenced by the microbiota in your lungs. And this microbiota will be influenced by the microbiota in your intestine. And there are many ways for, to explain the, this, this link. And, uh, and those ways, they are, it's the fact that they are metabolized, like the short chain fatty acids, for example, they are, they are going through the mesenteric lymphatic system and then to the bloodstream. Uh, there are also fragments, also bacteria they are going through, but the most important communication way is the metabolites. And the first one is the short-chain fatty acids. It's incredible. We know, actually, that, for example, good bacteria, like the Fecalibacterium, Roseburia, Ruminococcus, and, and others, they are producing this butyrate, this short-chain fatty acid. And this butyrate is going to the um, your bones and it's going to stimulate your, your, your production of monocytes that's going to they're going to call they, they will be called uh, I don't know the name in English but it's monocytes they are patrolling patrol monocyte I don't know they, they are moving and those monocytes are moving to the, the lungs and then they will say there okay relax, re reduce the inflammation, don't recruit inflammatory cells, and uh, like a neutrophil and others, and they reduce the inflammation. And that's one way of communication. The other ways are the production of different cytokines that they're going to, to the lungs. Another way is the IgG, and the third way is the fact that uh, dendritic cells will stimulate, as I said before, the differentiation from the naive uh, lymphocytes to TH17, TH1, and everything, and this one will also make a migration to the to the lungs, and that's all the the, the different uh, pathways we know to explain this influence, and um, voila, that's very important. And concerning, for example, the COVID, this is a really interesting study that showed that. The, the light or moderate or a severe uh, COVID will be influenced by the type 1 interferon response. And we know that if the interferon type 1 response is important and quite early, it can, uh, uh, the, the results can be a light to moderate COVID. And if the, 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 the response in interferon is dilated and uh, uh, lower, the, they're going to drive to a severe COVID. And you can see here in this uh, 
representation. In the first case, you have a, the response is quite high and quite early, and then you see that the level of inflammatory cytokines is quite low, and lymphocyte production is, is good, and the disease severity is quite low. And in the other situation here, when the, the response is uh, delayed and, uh, and, and lower, the, the inflammatory cytokines production is bigger and the lymphocyte, lymphocyte production is uh, lower and the disease severity is really bigger. And okay, but what was the relation between the microbiota? And that's what we will see here, is that they make, they make in 2019 uh, a, a really interesting study published in, in Cell thing. It's, uh, it's a study on, on rats and they, they modified the, 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 the microbiota. And first what they did is to give an antibiotic treatment. And with this antibiotic treatment, there was a microbiota depletion, that's normal. And after that, they infect, the, 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 they, make, uh, they, they give influenza uh, to the mice. Uh, and what we see is that the, the response, the interferon response was really low and the influenza severity was, was, was really important. And after that, they make a fecal transplantation to these mice, then to restore the microbiota, or they use other mice. They were untreated by antibiotic, and then they have finally a good microbiota. And if they, make an in, they, they induce an infection with the influenza to those uh, mice, the response in interferon was very good, and the thing is that the severity of the disease was low. And that's very, very interesting to say that uh, this first, we know that interferon is absolutely essential for protection against viral infection because it's one of the first steps of the, the degradation of the virus. And, uh, and voila. Then, why? are you here tonight and why do we talk so much about the microbiota in 2022? It's because there are many links that, that were discovered between the microbiota composition and the overweight, obesity, diabetes, non NASH, the cardiovascular prevention, colon cancer prevention, IBS, IBD, allergy, autoimmune disease, depression, multiple sclerosis, uh, and Parkinson and Alzheimer. That's a, that's a lot, and that, and it's not all, but that's already a lot of diseases. They were certainly connected with the microbiota composition. To talk about briefly, because I know there are, I have a specialist here, but it's going to be really brief. But maybe I hope I can give a, a conference just about this subject. Is the link between the microbiota and the brain? and the depression, anxiety, and other things. Uh, at the beginning, like for other subjects, you know, it started with the famous fecal transplantation studies. And that, that's the beginning of the studies about microbiota in 2006. The, the first thing, they, they transplant a microbiota for, for, for lean mice to an obese mice, and the obese mice became, became lean and in, the other, in the other way. Uh, and also, they transplant a, a microbiota for, for, from a stressed mice to a cool mice, and the cool mice became stressed, and, uh, and, and in the other way too. And that, that was the first, the, first, uh, the first studies, they were really, they were make a, a, a clinical connection with the microbiota and disease. There were other studies made, with an, and they were made with antibiotics, or probiotics, or germ-free studies, or infection studies, and all those studies showed that when you modify the microbiota, you can modify the mood of the mice, and, uh, and the anxiety of the mice, and uh, things like this. And many years after, we know more about the subject, and we also know specifically that the, 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 the link between the, 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 the gut microbiota and the brain is like an highway with four, four ways. Mm -hmm. We know that there are specifically, what's the most important is metabolites produced by the microbiota. And they can go through the blood, the first thing. The other thing is to 
modif to stimulate the, 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 the production of cytokines uh, by the immune system, and that's very, very important. We know the famous thing that when the you have a pro-inflammatory microbiota with too many bacteroides or too many proteobacteria, and, uh, and they, this one have an access to the intestine, and they will stimulate the production of cytokines. And those cytokines, when they arrive in the brain, what's going to happen is they, they will make an inhibition of uh, an enzyme who's transforming the tryptophan in serotonin. And the tryptophan will be transformed into what we call the tricat in English, the tryptophan catabolites, like the kinurenin. And the, 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 re the result is that you don't produce serotonin properly. And we also know that if you have too many proteobacteria, those proteobacteria are, are, are using, as the name said, they, they're using protein as a food. And then they will also use the tryptophan and the tyrosine as food. And it means that the, this tryptophan and tyrosine will not be uh, I'm say that it cannot be used by, by your body, and that's another way of communication. The third way is that some metabolites, like also the famous short chain fatty, as fatty acids, will modify what happens in the enterochromaffin cells in the intestine. That the one they are producing many neuropeptides, like the neuropeptides Y, the 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 GLP one and uh, also the serotonin, they are producing serotonin. We also know that, for example, if you have, if you have too much inflammation in your, in, your, in, your, in your microbiota, and after that in your gut, and you're producing too many uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, that can stimulate some nocive receptors in your, in your gut, in the famous, what we call the second brain in the gut, and those nocive receptors will make that you, you have pain. And, they can, and the, we also know that it's going to modify the, the, the transport of the serotonin, and you have a, a, level, a too high level of serotonin in your gut that's going to modify the peristaltism. The, 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 yeah, the peristaltism you said in English, I think, too. The fact is, the, yeah, thank you. And, uh, and, uh, and voila. And that's, uh, that's very, very uh, interesting to know. And the, the fourth way of communication is via the, 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 the famous vag vagus nerve directly to the brain. And on the other side, you have the communication directly from the brain to the gut on, on different pathways. But I, I will show you later uh, what's going on with this. Another subject is the microbiota and obesity. You know that there is a really interesting link between this <laughs> and I will show you this, this uh, example of two people that are coming to your consultation. And they say, okay, you know what, I would like, doctor, I would like to lose weight. Uh, and what, the only thing you can see is that they want to lose weight and they have a big belly and that's it. But you don't know what's, what's in it. You don't know what's the microbiota if it's different, this one from this one, and if it's different, maybe the treatment will not be the same. And that's what happens here. You have the patient number one, this is his microbiota, and the patient number two, this is his microbiota. As you can see, they are quite different. Huh? Here is the, what, what we say the normal microbiota, and here you have patient one, patient two. And in the patient one, what does it mean, the, the fact that the, the blue family is so important? We know that there are firmicutes, and in this firmicutes you have good of bad bacteria, but you have many, many firmicutes. And what we know with firmicutes too, is that they are producing enzymes. They have the ability to digest stark really, really completely and really quickly. And then you have an absorption of this stock, which is really increased. And that's what we can call a super extractor microbiota. It will extract the energy from what you eat, and especially from the carbs you eat. And it means that these people are really, really, uh, should really follow a diet without carbs. 
very important, even at the beginning, uh, really even quite low in fibers. Not too long, because after fibers are very important, as you know, for, for the microbiota. In the other way, here it's exactly uh, the, like the, the, the um, what I show you before uh, with with the with, with, the, with the, the excess of lipopolysaccharides. They're going through the intestinal barrier. They are stimulating the stimulating the TLA4 uh, receptor of the macrophage. They are producing cytokines, and then there's an inflammation of visceral fat and insulin resistance and weight gain. There are two different uh, mechanisms of gaining weight, and the diet will be like a keto diet here, and the diet in this case will be completely different. It's got to be more, a more close to, not a really vegan diet, but more close than a vegan diet with, more, with a lot of prebiotics. Uh, that's important to know. And as I, accept, as I explained sorry, uh, before, normally the, the human genome is producing only 17 enzymes to digest carbs, like uh, the lactase or the lactose and saccharose and everything, then you have 17. And we know that the microbiota is producing the all microbiota, I mean, a thousand of different species. We don't have, everybody has not the thousand species. But the all human microbiota is able to produce 56,000 of different type enzymes. They can digest residual starch like glycan in, in, uh, in different uh, vegetables and, um, and, all and different others. Uh, type of carbs. And that's very important to know because you, you will not give the same diet. And we, when we come back to our first patient, there's a, a lot of dysphemicates. And as you can see, what's interesting is even the, the famous ratio of firmicute bacteroidetes is really, really high. Uh, it's not a reason why he has a good firmicute. He doesn't have enough of Fecalibacterium, for example, and not enough of Lactobacillus. Mm. He doesn't have a lot of Bacteroides, for, for sure. He doesn't have a lot of Bifidobacterium, and he has really uh, not a good uh, microbiota, and not a lot of Achaemantia. And in this case, uh, the idea is to, to follow a diet low in carbs, close to the keto diet, and you can increase the omega-3. This is uh, why, because it's a cobiotic, to increase the level of Ackermantia and cranberry and grape, it's also a cobiotic. We know the difference between prebiotic, probiotic, cobiotic. Prebiotic is fiber for the good bacteria, probiotic is bacteria, and cobiotic is like a vitamin to, to improve the growth of bacteria, but it's not really exactly food bacteria. And postbiotic is something which is produced by bacteria, like the short chain fatty acids, for example, like the bacteriocins. And voilà. um, uh, also, it could be interesting to do intermittent fasting. Uh, I suppose you know, everybody knows what the intermittent fasting know. And uh, because we know that intermittent fasting could increase the level of Ackermantia, also. That's the sort of reason why. This is the diet more precisely, but we will not talk about that in details. You have many things to say about that. The, you can ask for the presentation, uh, and then you can read. I think we can do that. You can ask for the presentation if you want to, and then you can read the, the, the diet if you want to also. And um, what treatment for this patient? I can use the berberine. You know that, berberine? Hmm? Berberine is uh, it's an extract of a berry. It's a uh, epine vinette in French, you can say that, but it's not in our dietary culture. Uh, it's uh, in Iranian people, they eat uh, berberine, but we, we don't do. And uh, berberine is very, very interesting because there are many studies that show that th it improves the, the glucose tolerance, the level of glycated hemoglobin, level of glucose. It also improve the lipid profile, and it also reduce the NASH. 
and it's very very a metabolic interesting uh, treatment and what we know too is that the berberine is not is not it's absorbed but the, the percentage of absorption of the berberine is really low and it means that the, the, the way the berberine acts it's it's uh, on the microbiota and it, that's the, the the fact that it modified the microbiota is probably the way she has all this metabolic effect because there are many studies to show other mechanism inside body but but if third, only three percent have absorbed you know it's not what explain the the results and also you can give omega-3 to this patient the patient number two it's a bit like the woman I showed the, the case I showed you about the, the, the first woman uh, with with uh, irritable bowel syndrome and insulin resistant it's a little bit the same the same situation here then you see that's completely different completely different and it's about this thing that you remember and in this case the diet will be sp more specifically to avoid the western diet than run meat daily meats processed food uh, fats such like this and also sugar like usually and it's more vegetarian with a lot of prebiotic uh, and fiber in the diet and it's got to be to promote oat flakes all this type of berries they are the cobiotics uh, all the the, the, the vegetables con con like lentils chickpeas and everything also a lot of prebiotic it's all prebiotic diet with artichoke asparagus onion leeks garlic and everything with olive oil certainly fatty fish with for the omega-3 and if you the, the the carbs that you will use you will prefer carbs with a low glycemic index like the quinoa steamed potatoes and and after that you know that steamed potatoes and after that you put them in a fridge and the day after you, you do a salad with that and we know that they are rich in uh, resistant stock, as we say that, and it's a, a type, also a type of prebiotic. It's com the, and the glycemic index is completely different with a, with a cold potatoes than in a puree, for example. In a puree, it's, it's 100 percent, and then poof. And uh, in, a, in a salad with cold potatoes, it's 30 per the, the level, the in it's not a person. The, the, the index is 30, and the other one is, in the puree, it's 100 that it's important to know and avoid all this thing hmm? this is an example of a, of a day and uh, uh, what you can give as a, uh, as a supplementation is uh, what we call cobiotics and one very interesting cobiotic for to, to increase the level of acromantia is the green tea extract uh, then you can find pills with a green tea extract in a high concentration or you, you drink a lot of green tea it's another another way with the caffeine in it too and the rest of the with an extract of grape and the omega-3 another subject uh, where the, the the microbiota plays a role is the cardiovascular diseases and firstly uh, it's obvious that the, the first mechanism is to prevent obesity and diabetes and metabolic syndrome because that's what we know. We know that the metabolic syndrome, uh, I, I don't, will not tell you what it is, this is either criteria for the metabolic syndrome. But what's interesting to see here is that when you consider all cause mortality without metabolic syndrome or with metabolic syndrome this is without and with metabolic syndrome then the level is increased from five person to uh, 18 person it's very very important and when you consider the cardiovascular mortality uh, it's increased from from maybe two to three percent to to 13 percent then it's uh, the the impact of the metabolic syndrome of uh, disease uh, and on mortality uh, all causes are specifically cardiovascular mortality is uh, really huge and what's the process the process is that when you have this famous uh, LPS we are going through the intestinal barrier and after that you are we have a production by the liver of the CRP the, fam the famous 
protein, inflammatory protein, the CRP, and generally it's what we call the high sensitive CRP, it's a low level of CRP, and you have a low grade inflammation. And this high sensitive CRP is going through the, the, um, the vascular wall and it can make an inflammation, induce an inflammation of this vascular wall. Who, as we know, it's really uh, fundamental to, to develop arteriosclerosis. And, um, and that's very important to avoid this famous low-grade inflammation. And this famous low-grade inflammation is uh, absolutely correlated to the microbiota. Another point is the microbiota and cancer. And uh, since many years, we know that uh, the colon cancer is related to what you eat. That's not a, it's not a scoop. Hmm? We know that if you eat a lot of fibers, a lot of vegetables, and if you don't eat too much meat, you reduce uh, the, the, your chance to develop a, a, a colon cancer. But we know more, actually. And there's many, many things to say about that. It could be a whole conference um, about the subject. But we know that the diet is related to the cancer, the diet is related to the microbiota, and they are both related to the cancer. And also, the diet and the microbiota are considering also the earth's metabolism and immunity are related to the cancer. And what's important is to know that the way you you eat and the way you will modify or modulate your microbiota uh, will play a role in what we call the primary prevention. That it means what's the primary prevention is the, it's what you can do to avoid to develop a cancer. Will play a role in the tertiary prevention. It means what you're going to do to avoid uh, recidive. You can say that. And but not only that, we know that the microbiota could reduce chemotherapy and radiotherapy side effects and more specifically uh, the, the, the side effect of the chemotherapy on the diarrhea, the famous diarrhea, inflammation and the mucitis and the inflammation of the, of the, of the mouth with the chemotherapy. And, um, and it's important to know because for, for a long period uh, there are there are many oncologists that they say, oh no, don't give probiotic to a people with a, with a leaky gut or with a, with a chemotherapy because, because of the chemotherapy you will have a leaky gut and if you give probiotics, those probiotics will go through the barrier and you're going to have like, like a bacteremia. And the thing, it's, it's not the case because there were absolutely never any studies that show that if you give probiotic, you induce a bacteremia. But there is two studies, and that's important to know, they show that if you give Saccharomyces boulardii, which is not exactly a probiotic with more yeast, you can induce, in this case, a bacteremia. Then if a patient has um, a chemotherapy and a, and a leaky gut induced by the chemotherapy, it's really, really important to give him probiotic and probiotic at a high level, but not Saccharomyces boulardii. That's the thing to know. And, um, and it's quite normal that it's a good thing to give probiotic because, because of the leaky gut, it's probably better there are good bacteria going through than bad bacteria going through the intestine because they are, they are bacteria, <laughs> at the, so certainly. And we know that the fact that you give good bacteria re reduces considerably um, diarrhea and, and, and mycitis. It depends also which type of probiotic you give. And what's it's even more surprising and interesting is the therapeutic effect of the microbiota on the treatment, on the chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and uh, radiotherapy. And uh, we know that, for example, uh, people with a chemotherapy in a, in a colon cancer, if they, they have too many physiobacteria, they are very bad bacteria, they are causing uh, colon cancer, the, the, the response to the chemotherapy is reduced because those physiobacteria have 
and uh, an inhibitory effect on the apoptosis induced by the chemotherapy. And that's, uh, I will show you a little bit later. And we know that the, the microbiota plays a role on cancer, on the digestive system cancer, and for, for sure for the colon cancer, that's what we, we, we know, but also on extra digestive cancer. And what's the process? Probably the, the main process is the fact that if you have a bad microbiota, an unbalanced microbiota, and it will create what we call this famous low-grade chronic inflammation. And the low-grade, just excuse me a second, I have to drink. <laughs> mm. And the low-grade inflammation is playing an important role in cancer in, in emission and progression. We know that it plays a role on all different uh, levels of the progression. For first thing, we know that this low-grade inflammation could induce easily genomic mutation. It's one of the factors, not only one. You know, there are many uh, genotoxic factors, like environmental, psychological, there are many different ones. It's not only this one, but you know that the chronic inflammation is one important thing. We know also that, that this uh, chronic inflammation will help the promotion and the growth of the, of the, of the tumor, and it will help to, to, to produce some metalloproteinase, dif different enzyme. They, they will destroy the tissue against the, 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 the tumor, and the tumor can grow better. And they also will play a role, the, the, the inflammatory situation will play a role on the angiogenesis, then it makes that the, the, the tumor will be more uh, vascular, vascularized and they will, can grow better. And it also will play a role, the inflammation induced by this, will also play a role of what we call the, the epithelial transition. Because we know that epithelial cell, that if you, if you take epithelial cell like, like the, the, the enterocytes, hmm, uh, they, are, they are not moving cells. Your, your, your epithelium doesn't, doesn't move, it remains where it, where it is, at the same place. And why is it possible that those cells are migrating? Because they, they, they um, obtain special powers and they have the ability, they are a little bit transformed, and they have the ability to go away, and to go far away, to have this mobility. And this, what we call this is the epithelial transition, is also increased if you are in a pro-inflammatory situation. And then, this we know that this microinflammation and this superoxidation is associated promotes the cancer on all the different levels. Uh, I, I don't have time to explain you everything today, but that's the thing. And concerning the colorectal cancer, there was specifically one bacteria, they are uh, in the cause of it. As I explained for the obesity, for the IBS or the IBD, there's also a microbiota signature for the, for the colon cancer. And it's very, very important. You can say it's, it's like the secondary prevention because, you know, primary prevention is the way you avoid it. Secondary prevention is all the exams you can do to, to, to make the diagnosis quite uh, quickly. And if you have, for example, a patient who has a familiar uh, history, familial history of uh, colon, colonic cancer, uh, it's really important, I think, to make a, a dose of an analysis of the microbiota because if there is too many fusobacterium, specifically, if there is too many bacteroides, if there is too many Escherichia coli, and if there is not enough bifidobacteria or fecalibacterium, we know that a signature of a colonic cancer. And this patient, he has to go quite quickly to do a, a, a colonoscopy. And I, I had a case in my patient. I saw that, I said, oh, let's go, and it was okay, but they have 
they have some uh, some disturbance already, and that that's really a, an important uh, thing to know about the signature uh, on colonic cancer. And the uh, Fusobacterium, as I explained just before, it is really he has two major uh, properties. The one is to induce inflammation in the colon, and the second one is to suppress host immunity against this disturbance. And um, also, he has a third one property. This is to, to uh, reduce the chemotherapy uh, apoptosis, uh, the apoptosis induced by the chemotherapy. And that's, that's why we, we, there are many, many studies that show that the, the way the, 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 the microbiota is well balanced helps the efficacy of chemotherapy treatment and also immunotherapy treatment. Um, that's the case. Concerning the breast cancer, it's not, the link is not so evident than with the colonic cancer, but we know actually so there is a link, and there are many publications that show that, and that in the patient with a receptor positive, estrogen receptor positive, uh, there is a relation with the microbiota. And the mechanism is, is the following one, is the, the fact that normally, as you know, estrogen are conjugated in the liver to a transporter, and with the transporter they're going through the bile up to the intestine, and they are going away until they exit. But the thing is, if you have some bacteria, some type of Clostridium and others, they are producing the enzymes, they will um, make a, I'll say that, they, they will take off the, the estrogen for the transporter, this, this, one, this estrogen will be reabsorbed, and then you have a, a estrogen impregnation with two, with bigger than it should be. And we know that in the, in the case of a patient with a, she has a susceptibility, the fact you, you induce this uh, estrogen excess uh, can lead to, to, the, to develop uh, breast cancer. Then, to, uh, to end the, the, the session, I will talk about what's good food for your microbiota. You know, first one is this one. Uh, you recognize it. Pay attention with that. You know, because if you eat too much, you will be bloated like you've never been in your life. You know, that's really, really dangerous thing. But it's really containing a lot of prebiotic. You have also the pane, the salsifi, the nave, the asparagus, interesting too, chicory, sure. Garlic and onions, fantastic, fantastic food because it contains prebiotic. It also contains quercetin, who has a, a really interesting role as an antioxidant, and also on the modulation of what we call the NRF2. Uh, that's really interesting for, for many, for the antioxidant activity. The artichokes, bananas, uh, bananas, when they are not too, uh, how do you say, too much, to measure. Hmm? Uh, ideal, ideally, to have a lot of prebiotics, they, they, they should be green. But it's a bit like the topinambu, you know. It's, a, it's not a really good advice, I think. And this are very, very important. Then the 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 grenade uh, and all the berries. It's uh, very, very, very good because they are, they, are, they play the role as an antioxidant as a prebiotic, as a cobiotic, uh, many, many roles, they are very good for your health. And the omega-3, because we know that omega-3, um, <coughs> there are many, many properties of omega-3, I will not talk about that, you know that already, but as you can see today, omega-3 have also a role as a cobiotic and good for the microbiota. And finally, if the situation is completely desesperated, if you try many treatment, many diet, and it's not getting better, you can, but you cannot, that's the problem, you should be able to do a fecal transplantation. And actually, um, 
the fecal transplantation in Europe is only uh, accepted for people with a Clostridium difficile uh, infection. And they do it in many hospitals uh, in this indication and only in this indication. For the little story, I don't know if you know that, who discovered the fecal transplantation? It's an Australian doctor. Uh, he, he had a patient who has a clost Clostridium difficile infection and, and she was recidiving. Uh, as, as always the thing, one, two, three, four, and each time she was losing, losing, losing weight, and the situation became really dramatic, and he said, no, no wh what can you do? I will not give her antibiotic again, because I tried already five times, uh, let's do something else, and he did. He makes the thing in his garage, I don't know, and he did the, the thing, and, and it was a miracle. The patient survived and everything was okay. And you know what's the result after that? Uh, he had a problem with uh, Ordre de Médecins. Uh, yeah. It's not good to be really a pioneer for them. And, and then he had a problem and after that now we know that it's absolutely fantastic. And we use it for the Clostridium difficile and also there are many studies that show that it's really interesting in obesity, in autism, in uh, IBD, in uh, different pathologies. But why are they waiting for that? The, the, the thing is, actually, the, the, they, are, they want to have more uh, experience and to see what, what's happening with the donor of the, of the, the fecus uh, after many years if they don't develop specific pathologies. They want to find the, space, the, the golden boy or girl, uh, uh, the golden donor. Uh, and that's uh, okay, maybe, maybe, but I, I don't completely agree with this idea because we know that even if you make a transplantation, uh, a fecal transplantation, the microbiota directly after the transplantation will be completely different. It will be like the, the microbiota of the, the donor and not of the receiver. But we also know that if you check what's going on one year after that, the, the microbiota is already starts to, to, uh, to, to become like it was before. It's not forever. And it's, what's the explanation? There are two uh, explanations. The first one is the way you eat, the way you live, and finally you will reproduce what it was before. And the second one is that we know there are some bacteria in the crypts, deeply in the crypts, they're still there. And they have the power to, to grow it again, uh, like it was before. Then uh, nothing is forever with this thing. But it's, uh, it's like if you m modify the microbiota of your patient, with, if you change his diet or with prebiotic, probiotic, antibiotic, never mind the treatment you do, what I'm doing, I do this. I make a control of the microbiota four or six months after because it takes a little bit of time to, to be modified. And, uh, and then uh, after that, it's, it's important to, 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 to explain to your patient that he, ha he has to follow a part of, a part of what you give him. Or he can make some, some cure, you know, give probiotic not all the time. Uh, at the beginning, I'd give it for four months, for example, and then I control the microbiota. And after that, if it's okay, I say, okay, you can take it all three, three days a week or one month every three months. Uh, you, you have to continue a little bit what you did, otherwise it's not going to be okay. And um, voila. The thing is, I will finish with this interesting study made by the children, Boston Children's Hospital. With kids, they have a... a uh, pop, 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 pop. I don't know, they, they have a, a Clostridium difficile infection and they give what we call poop in a pill then they didn't make it fecal transplantation but they give like this but in pills and they have quite good results finally they said they have 90% of success I, I'm a bit surprised by this because I, I think that but I don't know exactly how they did the study but it's really interesting but I think that it's it's not like a fecal transplantation, and I think the fecal transplantation is certainly better. And before that, the way you can modify the, micro the microbiota of your patient and you can control is absolutely uh, more 
in interesting and, and affordable uh, for many of you. Voila, I hope that you are interested to go further in the microbiota story. And uh, I think now it's time to, to answer to your, to your questions. Um, voila, thank you. Okay, I, I have the notion that there is a, a, a strong difference for the babies who are born through the normal way, the natural way, and the babies coming out from a cesarean section. Exactly, exactly. Then th there is a, a huge difference, and that's what I said before, it's that the, the, this, uh, the natural uh, birth is very important for, for, the, for, the, for the constitution of the microbiota, even if there is other steps, like the, the breastfeeding and the quality of the, the microbiota of the mother, but it's important also for the, for, the, for, for the birth itself. And after that, also, for, for kids, they have to take, for example, IP, omeprazole, pantomet, and things like this for, problem, for, for gastric problem. Uh, it's not good for the microbiota at all. Uh, or kids, they have to take antibiotics because they have, I don't know, a kidney infection or, or many other reasons. That's not good either. And all those things could have an effect. Uh, hopefully, it depends. There also a, a genetic, I think, a genetic um, predisposition. And I think that you have some kids, they, they have all bad condition. The, the prematurity, the, the antibiotics and everything, and after that, the microbiota is not so bad. Uh, and uh, voila, but that's, that's an exception. Normally, the, the, way, the way the delivery uh, occurs, and uh, the breastfeeding, and if you can avoid to have uh, a meprazole or thing like this when you're a kid, if you avoid uh, enteropathogen infection, uh, antibiotics, that's all the thing that could play a role. And after that, uh, when you become older, the way you eat is important, but there's also an another thing, you will not be surprised, it's the stress. We know that the, the stress plays a, a, a major role because we know, for example, a really interesting thing recently discovered is that with the neurogenergic uh, pathway, um, it stimulates the production in the intestine cells of what we call the serine protease. Serine protease is an enzyme we will cut boom, 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 the mucus because in the mucus, the mucus is, is a combination uh, of three amino acids. You have the serine, uh, treonine, and, uh, and proline, and also sometimes cysteine, but that's the thing. And on this one, you have glycated uh, groups with, the, the, with food for bacteria too. And this bacteria will, will, will cut the serine uh, uh, links and then it means that the microbiota will be completely cut off and what happens is what I said before is that the bad bacteria, pro-inflammatory bacteria can have a contact with the intestine and that's one way for example that the, 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 the brain could modify the microbiota and could modify the access of good bad bacteria to the intestine and what's interesting also to know is that the bifidobacteria uh, they have many different properties, but one of them is to produce an inhibitor of serine protease. That's uh, interesting. Voila, ano another question? Yeah? So, a uh, practical question. So, you have a patient that wants to analyze his uh, gut bacteria. Yeah. So how many poo samples do you take and how, how do you do it? I mean, how does it come in a practical way? Okay, that's a good, very good question. Then practically, uh, yes, to, to take two little nuts of stool and you, there's a specific vial because it's, you don't put it in a, in, a, in a vial, an ordinary vial. It's a specific vial containing uh, a, a liquid which contains a, a DNA stabilizer, then it means that the DNA will not, uh, there's no reproduction after that. Then you, what's interesting is you see what's going on in the gut and not in the vial. And that's why it's cut off. And it's very important because 
I know that some company they propose a microbiota analysis. They don't have this DNA stabilizer, and we did at the lab. We did different uh, analyses with the product, without the product, and what's going on and everything. And it's very important. And then the thing is practically, then you collect this tool, you put two nuts in this little vial with the liquid, and you can bring it to the lab practically uh, here, uh, because the lab is in Belgium, and here the, it's at the Maison Medicale. You can bring it to the Maison Medicale, because they, they're working with the lab. And, and um, when if do do you have to 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 bring it directly or not? What's interesting is with the this uh, specific DNA stabilizer, we know that it could be analyzed 15 days after. Well, we don't do it; it's just a few days. But it it, it it for the transportation time, it's there's no problem. Uh, do you have to choose one day, or you eat something special, or if your stool are more firm or more liquid? It doesn't change really a thing. It's quite. Uh, the, we know that the microbiota is quite stable, resilient uh, from one day to another, and uh, that's the thing. So I, I know that some labs, what they do is you have to take uh, not only one day, you have to take many consecutive days. So that's one thing that I know. So they don't on, only take one sample, they take three consecutive days. For the metagenomic analysis? for stool microbi uh, microbiome. <laughs> That's strange. And uh, the other thing they do as well, they do uh, take, they try to see if there are parasites as well. So yeah. that's another thing they check for. But, uh, they check the parasite with the culture or with the PCR? Actually, that's what the question I wanted to know about the bacteria. Do you do only PCR or you do culture as well? No, we, we, we do only PCR. And, and the, 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 yeah, we know the metagenomic analysis is it, uh, it's a JM PCR in a way, and um, and for the parasites we also do uh, PCR specific for parasites. Then what we use we we do PCR for for three parasites. They are where you could be. Uh, what we say, a healthy carrier of this parasite, but we know and we, we ask with different spe specialists in infectious pathology uh, that sometimes people, if they, are, they have this parasite, that could be healthy, but it could be also problematic. And it depends, the clinic who makes it different. And with, for example, a patient with diarrhea and pain and things like this, and, and especially with, if it's cyclic in this way, it's really interesting to ask this parasite PCR. And yeah, we do that too. The, but the, I'm really surprised by, by the fact they do three times the thing because it costs a lot, you know. Uh, or do, how much do you pay if they do three times a metagenomic analysis? It's the, the other thing as well they not do is yeah. they do a culture and yeah. they try to grow the bacteria. And the reason for that is when they do grow the bacteria, they can tell you they do an antibiogram and they can tell you which antibiotic you use for the, for the bacteria that you grow in the stool. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Uh, it depends for, for what. For if, you, if you try to know what's the, what's the microbiota for ob obesity problem or for brain or others, I think it's not really interesting to do that. Because the, the bacteria, if you do a culture of bacteria, you, re you will only see uh, aerobic bacteria for, for the left colon. You don't see anything else, or oh, just a little amount, but it's not uh, not significant. And if there is a problem, if there is a patient with a, a kind of a, yeah, inflammation, or you su suspect that the suspicion of uh, gut inflammation in, in, in the colon, uh, it's interesting also to do to combine with the culture, and because you have you can, you can be lucky because it's. Most of there are a lot of false negative to find bacteria and to see if there is a growth, and then you can do an antibiogram. That's right. That's why. But it's just uh, in this case. Then the thing is, for f I th the microbiota, it, one analysis is okay. You don't have to do it three times. Three times, it's, there's no reason for that. It's the way you use it, it's specifically for, for research of parasites, for parasites research, and it. it 
it depends which parasite because it, if you have some parasites and the parasites we, we are with eggs that's that's uh, you, you need to do it m many times but parasites it's not easy to, to find it in the culture that's why they ask to do it for three days then you you get more luck to find it uh, with, with three days but for the Meta genomic analysis, one, one time is enough. And, but to do a PCR for parasite, we do that, because I, I, I ask for that, because it's really important in different situations. And to do a culture, it's also interesting to do it in this specific condition of uh, inflammat inflammatory disease of the intestine. Yeah. The other thing we add as well is they try to find if there are any enzymes or vitamins uh, that are lacking because the absorption and what you receive in the stool depends on that as well. So the composition of the stool depends on your digestive system. If you have no uh, pancreatic enzymes, yeah, yeah. if you have no bile, Absolutely. so that, then the treatment depends on that as well. And only by seeing the microbiome, you cannot be able to treat the patient if you don't know the deficiencies he have in his digestive system. Okay, um, exactly. That that's what we were doing before before the microbiota analysis with what, what what's calling the flowing scan and all those type of analysis. It was a culture analysis plus a chemical analysis, as you say, and that's interesting because you have the pancreatic enzymes, for example, digestion of fiber, digestion of fat, and everything. And we 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 will do it uh, combine. That, that's the thing. We will finally we decided to to add. Uh, in all the analysis of microbiota in a, in, in a few months. It's, uh, it's interesting we talk about that because it's a, it's, it's a thing we will decide. It's not, it's not a, a, an expensive thing uh, and it's interesting. And uh, then, then we will have the microbiota thing, we will have the, the en enzymatic, uh, enzymatic activity, um, pH of the stools and things like this, chemical informations. And that's going to be the, 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 the major point. You can ask also metabol metabolomic things, like the short-chain fatty acids. You can ask also the, the metabolites for the, for the candida. And you can ask also, but you can, th that's the thing. If, if you, at the moment, it becomes really expensive. You can ask like the calprotectin. You can ask the beta defensin. You can ask, there are many other markers of uh, the IgE, secretory IgE and, uh, of inflammation they could be asked too, uh, for sure. Uh, and I have to thank you for your very good presentation. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Last um, I would like just you mentioned very briefly about fasting. I wanted just to know of what is the um, what is the impact on the microbiota, the, the fasting. Is that all good or bad or the know, fasting? Just, yeah. Okay. The fasting. Okay, there, uh, all right, then there are different types of fasting. There, are, there is the intermittent fasting, when it's, uh, it's quite short period, it's 16 hours, and that's the idea. And um, we know that's interesting, uh, specifically for different bacteria like the Ackermansia, uh, and things like this. Um, there's another way, it's what we call the, the fasting mimicking diet. I don't know if you heard about that. The fasting mimicking diet, it's a, it's a, it's a diet that looks like, it's like fasting, but it's not. Because you are eating, it's the Professor Walter Longo, if you don't know who, who invented it. Walter Longo is a very known one. This is the one who, who first makes studies to show that uh, if mice are not eating before chemotherapy, and the first day of chemotherapy, they have less side effect of the chemotherapy, and the, the eff, uh, uh, and the effect of the chemotherapy is better. And after that, he, he showed the same thing to human people. And a uh, and few years after that, he, he, he um, proposed this famous uh, fasting making diet because the fasting making diet is really interesting in cancer prevention, uh, for the microbiota too, and, it, and it's a diet where you really eat a little bit of different things. You can go to internet, you tap a fasting king diet, you will see what it is practically. And it's a diet for five days. And it's interesting to do it, not all the time, you do it maybe every three months, or maybe six months, or every year, 
but it's a very good thing to do. That's the second point. The third, and the thing is, in this fasting mimicking diet, you are eating uh, some vegetables, avocado, you are eating different things. And then you have the fasting, the complete fasting uh, for one week, for example, or more. And um, this is really important to know what's your microbiota before you do that. Be because what we know is that the bacteroides, for example, the famous bacteroides, they are bacteria, they are eating everything. They are eating carbs, they are eating proteins, and they are eating your mucus. And if you don't give anything to them, um, they will eat your mucus. And the thing is, you are, if you have a, a pro-inflammatory microbiota with a lot of bacteroides, and you start a fasting diet, um, you will feel good, because when, specifically people, when they have digestive problem, the less they eat, the better they feel. And if they don't eat anything, they feel really, really well. And then you will feel perfectly well during your fasting period. But the thing is, your microbiota will not getting better with this period. And when you will start to eat again, um, your, your, your microbiota will be more inflammatory than it was. Then pay attention for that. And then fasting is interesting, but check your microbiota before. That's the thing. Sorry, I think quite a quick question. I'm a GP, and now I'm, I'm scared to prescribe any antibiotics. Um, would you give uh, probiotics uh, capsules to any patient you prescribe antibiotics to? Or Certainly. And when? Uh, bef uh, at the same time or after you, the yeah, treatment? You, you, you can already give it at the same time and, and, after, and after the treatment for one month. And, so for certainly. One month. and which one would you recommend? Ah, yeah, it just has to be micro off. No, no, but <laughs> the thing is, no, th there is a one uh, I'm using, and this one is, uh, uh, okay, you said it's an evolution of uh, 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 an American probiotic. It was the VSL3. I don't know if you know that. It's a very good one. And all of the studies they make about inflammatory bowel syndrome, postitis, and different inflammation, and the only one with an interesting effect was the, uh, the VSL3. And now there exists a probiotic uh, with the same, the, the, the same strains than, than you find in the VSL3 plus two. And, but the thing is, it, it was uh, performed by, by this famous uh, South Korean company. This is to sell, 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 and fast, sell something. Um, and the thing is that they make this famous uh, double coating, and they, they also made scientific publication when they, they, they compare different, uh, there were four bifidobacteria with this coating or without this coating, and to see what's going on. And they see that there were 100 times more under, uh, bacteria alive uh, with this double coating. And this is the VSL3 with this double coating. And then, and the, yeah, and the name is just, that's the one I, I'm using. This is the, the voila, this is this one. I will tell you. Aha. I will tell you later. Okay. And, and, um, voila. And, Jack, I have a quick one as well. I have been a high level athlete by the past, and I was curious to know if by any chance it would be possible to elaborate, to imagine a kind of solution. Why not increasing or to prevent the performance of high level athletes? Yeah, that's a very, very interesting question because we know that in sport at the high level, the high level sport is not good for health. You know, it's a really pro oxidative and it creates easily the leaky gut. There are many, many uh, high performance sport players. Uh, they have the famous leaky gut. We know in tennis, for example, you know that Djokovic or Justin Hena, they, they avoid gluten completely because what? Because they have a leaky gut induced by sport and they understand that th there is a problem. And why do this sportive have a leaky gut? There are two reasons for that. The first reason is there's an over-oxidative 
activity and the over oxidative activity creates the leaky gut. And the second one is that uh, frequently they, 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 they have the, the circulation, the blood circulation is, is not irrigating enough the, 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 the gut because it goes to the muscles. And the combination of, of this uh, low irrigation combined with a high level of oxidation is probably the reason why you find so frequently uh, a leaky gut. And as you can see, if you have a leaky gut and if a, 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 a not a good microbiota, and that's what you find in some sport players, that they don't pay attention to, the, to their nutrition, you can easily have this famous a low-grade inflammation. And what happens to a sportive with a low-grade inflammation is what occurs is injuries different muscular injuries, uh, joint injuries, uh, and things like this, and, and a low level of recuperation. And they can start to have also food intolerance related to this leaky gut. That's a, then that's, I think it's very uh, important to, to pay attention to the leaky gut and to the microbiota in a high level sport uh, players. Yeah, thank you again. Okay, bye.